more protein versus less protein activating rap, uh, mTOR in a way that is counterproductive? I think it can. Um, I think there, I think there are probably certain, certainly cases where it can. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, I don't, I don't know that anybody has really carefully done that study in mice. There, there was a study. It's a really interesting study by um, Steve Simpson and colleagues where, where they did this nutritional geometry work, where they mm. basically looked at different compositions of carbohydrates. Steve fats, Simpson, and he's proteins. in Australia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, looked at, I don't remember how many diets, there's a whole range of diets, right? Different compositions of the three macronutrients. Tried to control for caloric intake, which is hard, as you can imagine, but I think they did a pretty good job. Um, and then asked, you know, what, what does it look like in terms of metabolism, energy expenditure, lifespan? So the lifespan studies, I think, are, are, are pretty clear that most of the diets where the mice lived the longest were towards the low end in protein. But there were some things that I think called into question exactly what was going on there because it wasn't the case that the, the, the mice that were energetic, the diets that were energetically lowest gave the longest lifespan, as you might expect from caloric restriction. And the diet that actually gave the absolute longest lifespan had like, I don't know, it was like a 40% protein in it, right? So, so the way I interpret that is that there are many ways to get to And longevity. how calorie restricted was that? They, they, were, they were not calorically restricted at all. So you're These saying that a diet that was ad lib with 40% protein had the best outcome? The, the best absolute lifespan, yes. Again, how, how do we even reconcile well, this body this, of literature? Yeah, and this is sort of what I, where I was just going is I think that my view is there are probably multiple paths to longevity. Mm -hmm. And we really don't understand the, the interrelationships of these macronutrients in, in the diet with enough sophistication to to get beyond sort of broad general predictions. And again, you know, I sort of this is an area where I I really I believe, like I can't prove it, but I my intuition from of from the the data that I've seen and just my observations of people is that in humans, it's probably very this relationship between protein and health during aging is probably very different than it is in in mice. I think mice are able to tolerate a very low protein diet without, you know, some of the consequences that we yep. see in people. That's my intuition. I don't, you know, I, I don't know that that's true. But I mean, that's it's my, my intuition. intuition well, uh, as well, because clinically what we see in what I call the death bars, the death bars is our internal nomenclature for how people die. We just constantly look at death bars and we double click and double click and double click all the way to try to tease out everything that is reducing lifespan and health span. And the problems that occur in humans when they are under muscled yeah. are insane. Yeah. And it ranges from the metabolic consequences of being under muscled. Our muscles are a sink for glucose. They are the single most important sink we have for glucose and our ability to tolerate glucose and maintain glucose homeostasis in the presence of larger, more metabolically healthy muscles is the difference between having diabetes and not having diabetes. Right. Furthermore, when you think about sarcopenia and when you think about osteoporosis, which again, I just don't think we're talking about how these things impact animals. Like we don't study any animal, including primates in a setting where sarcopenia and osteoporosis are problematic. And yet I would ask anyone to consider the entire population that they know over the age of 75. Yeah. And I would ask you, take every person that is alive today that's over 75 and tell me how many of them are not suffering at least some consequence of one or both of those phenomenon. And if somebody did that analysis, I would be shocked if we didn't find at least 80% of people over the age of 75 are experiencing this. And if you look at the activity, just monitor the activity level of people over the, at, once they hit 75, they fall off a cliff. So muscle mass dramatically plummets, activity levels dramatically plummet. It, difficult to say which one's feeding which. Yeah. But there's no question that something is happening to our species at about the age of 75 right. that is a structural problem. And none of this other stuff matters if that sucks, right? Like right. I don't care if I live to 100 <laughs> and don't have cancer if I'm an invalid for the last 25 years yeah. and I can't play with my grandkids and throw a ball. Like it just, for me personally, I'm not saying that's a, that's not a view that everyone should take in the world. I'm just telling you that's my view. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and I, I mean, I think that's absolutely 
Correct. I guess the question, and I think this is still where some of the confusion comes from, is um, how important is dietary protein in that maintenance of muscle or loss of muscle in people who are going to go you know, the, the wrong direction. And I think the data is that it is quite important. I mean, when you, there are lots of studies that have compared, you know, the RDA versus, you know, kind of the, the double RDA standard, yeah. and it's a significant difference. Yeah. Um, protein makes a very big difference, you know, following obviously, um, the training that, that is necessary to stimulate muscle protein right. synthesis. So, so I think those have to be coupled to absolutely. some extent. Yeah. 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 Um, I believe there are data, and I hate when I have to say this because I just, I'm going to say something and it's going to be wrong and 20 people are going <laughs> to okay, respond. I do it all the time. Uh, so, so just in anticipation <laughs> of the fact that, that there are data that I've read and I, I don't have the memory I once had. Um, I believe there are data that show just the protein difference alone can make some difference. Yeah but it's not nearly the difference you get when you pair it with hypertrophy training. Yeah, that, that's, that's my recollection as well, right? Which, which brings you know, us to the interesting question then, why is it that there is a camp? And, and in my field, it's a pretty vocal camp in the aging field, right? That would argue that low protein is the best nutritional strategy for aging and health span in people. And, you know, this is, this gets back to the point I'm, I, I kind of started with, which is that you can find the answer you want for almost any question in this area that intersects at nutrition and aging. There will be a study, right, yep. that will fit your belief. So I think you really have to be careful, or I try at least to, to take a global view and, and, and try to, to understand what is, what is the totality of the data say, right? But there are epidemiological studies and, and one in, in the field that um, most people will point to when they go to humans and they talk about low protein. And it, it was this, um, the study that uh, uh, Walter Longo was, um, I think the senior author on and Morgan Levine was the first author on where they looked at um, protein consumption and uh, all cause mortality uh, as a function of age in people. There were some, some studies in, I think they had some yeast studies in there as well, mm -hmm. maybe some cell culture studies, but they looked at the, the, the take home message was that low protein is beneficial up to about 65 years of age. And then once you get above 65 years of age, um, it kind of flips and people who ate a higher protein diet have lower all cause mortality. And I should be clear when I say beneficial, we're talking specifically about all cause mortality. Which at the end of the day is a very important metric. Sure, you want to be alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's not the most important <laughs> metric necessarily. You could argue it's equally important to the yeah. health span metrics. But it, I mean, that's yeah. that's a, okay. So let's make sure people understand what that means. That means below the age of sixty-five, the epidemiologic data in this study suggested right. people eating less protein had lower mortality in all-cause mortality, and above sixty-five, you saw that reverse. That's right. Yeah. Now, did that paper make any attempt to quantify the net impact on mortality? Because the very misleading thing about an assessment like that is when you look at mortality adjusted by population, before the age of 65, it's relatively low. Above the age of 65, it goes up very non-linearly. Yeah. Um, so when we do our death bar analysis, it's like, you know, this is the mortality, this is the death per 100,000 people if you're 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, yep. 90, like, you know what I mean? It just, yep. it becomes insane. Yes. So you could argue through that analysis that you're much better off with a high protein strategy, even if it's throughout life, because the absolute reduction in mortality would unquestionably be lower as a result of the benefit you would have later in life. So I would, um, I, I absolutely agree with, with conceptually with, with what you said, right? The, the impact of a change in mortality late in life is going to usually swamp the impact, certainly swamp the impact, the same impact on mortality yeah. early in life. I think the question here is what are the relative effects, That's right? right? Yep. And so, so they did try, they did model this a little bit and it, it is, um, in their model, which I, 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 I couldn't get the data for, like, I don't, I don't know, I can't, evaluate exactly yeah. what they did. But in their model, the uh, the the relative risk um, crossed somewhere, you know, in the 60s, right? In other words, you know, your, your total mortality benefit uh, 
was lower eating a high protein diet. I think it was starting somewhere in the 60s. And that actually surprised me because, I, because for exactly the reason you said, the relative impact of the high protein diet um, early in life would have to be an order of magnitude greater than the relative impact of the so I'm sorry, say what their finding was again at the age of six. I don't remember the exact okay. number. It's in the, it's in the paper, right? Yep. So you can see the curves. You can see the curves crossed. It was much later than I thought it would be given that 65 was the point that they, they kind of picked. Right? I see. I see. Yeah. So yeah, I would yeah. have thought maybe in your fifties. So I actually tried to do my own modeling of this off of the data that I, that I could find on, you know, relative risk for low and high protein. Again, where you, what you define low, what you define high, you know, there. And you're trying to ask the question, when should you switch the diet? Or maybe more formally, at what age do the does the risk equal out? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. What's the crossover? Yeah, yeah. And what did you find? When so you mine did was closer to like fifty. Yep. Um, that that's that's the point where uh, once you get past fifty, there the benefit of a high protein diet on mortality seems to outweigh any detriment that you would get from. Starting so that's earlier. odd to me because whether it's fifty or sixty, Matt, it's a benefit on mortality which is really, I think, where more of the argument is, there can't be any benefit on health span. From low protein, you no, mean? No, from high protein. Early in life or late? Why? Why can't there be a benefit? Oh, late in life, I'm saying. Why not? Well, I'm saying, like, if you're protein restricted late in life, I, I mean, I think- but Low protein has yeah. no benefit on yeah, health yeah, span. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, un I mean, again, unless- I I, so I would agree with you intuitively, but I also well, have sorry. I, I'll exclude special cases. So I'm not talking about people who have renal insufficiency for yeah. whom they have to. You know, I, yeah, yeah. Now, I agree with you conceptually. The only thing that makes me hesitate a little bit is I've just seen, like I was talking about the mouse rapamycin experiments, where everybody who knew anything about muscle said that if you gave a mouse rapamycin throughout life, it was going to get sarcopenia, and that just didn't happen. So. No, but I'm saying we have clinical data yeah, that yeah. suggests that when 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 people over the age of 65 are protein deficient versus protein significant, there's a there's a there's right. a huge difference in muscle mass, which we know is going to be associated with frailty and right, right. poor outcomes. Yeah. I, I would I would totally yeah. agree with that. I mean, I think that that it's it's very likely to be true. I think what we don't again we. I don't know. Do we have controlled studies where people were eating low protein and doing resistance training late in life? I mean, I, there are nuance here that, that could Fair. complicate yeah. things.